Chapter Three of the Scarlet Letter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ana Sofia Simão. The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter Three: The Recognition. From this intense consciousness of being the object of severe and universal observation. The wearer of the scarlet letter was at length relieved by discerning, on the outskirts of the crowd, a figure which irresistibly took possession of her thoughts. An Indian, in his native garb, was standing there. But red men were not so infrequent visitors of the English settlements that one of them would have attracted any notice from Mr. Prime at such a time. Much less would he have excluded all other objects and ideas from her mind. By the Indian's side, and evidently sustaining a companionship with him, stood a white man, clad in a strange disarray of civilized and savage costume. He was small in stature, with a furrowed visage, which as yet could hardly be termed aged. There was a remarkable intelligence in his features, as of a person who had so cultivated his mental part that it could not fail to mold the physical to itself and become manifest by unmistakable tokens. Although, by a seemingly careless arrangement of his heterogeneous garb, he had endeavoured to conceal or abate the peculiarity, it was sufficiently evident to Esther Prime that one of these men's shoulders rose higher than the other. Again, at the first instant of perceiving that thin visage and slight deformity of the figure, she pressed her infant to her bosom with so convulsive a force that the poor babe uttered another cry of pain. But mother did not seem to hear it. At his arrival in the market-place, and some time before she saw him, the stranger had bent his eyes on Nurse Prime. It was careless at first, like a man chiefly accustomed to look inward, and to whom external matters are of little value and import, unless they have a relation to something within his mind. Very soon, however, his look became keen and penetrative. A writhing horror twisted itself across his features, like a snake gliding swiftly over them, and making one little pause, with all its rapid intervolutions in open sight. His face darkened with some powerful emotion, which, nevertheless, he so instantaneously controlled by an effort of his will, that, save at a single moment, its expression might have passed for calmness. After a brief space, the convulsion grew almost imperceptible, and finally subsided into the depth of his nature. When he found the eyes of Esther Prime fastened on his own, and saw that she appeared to recognize him, he slowly and calmly raised his finger, made a gesture with it in the air, and laid it on his lips. Then, touching the shoulder of a townsman who stood near to him, he addressed him in a formal and courteous manner. "'I pray you, good sir,' said he, "'who is this woman, and wherefore is she here set up to public shame?' "'You must needs be a stranger in this region, friend,' answered the townsman, looking curiously at the questioner and his savage companion. "'Else you'd surely have heard of Mr. Esther Prime and her evil doings. "'She hath raised a great scandal, I promise you, in godly Master Dimsdale's church.' "'You say truly,' replied the other. "'I am a stranger, and have been a wanderer sorely against my will.' I have met with grievous mischiefs by sea and land, and have been long held in bonds among the ethan folk of the southward, and am now brought hither by this Indian to be redeemed out of my captivity. Will it please you, therefore, to tell me of Esther Prime's, if I have her name rightly, of this woman's offences, and what has brought her to yonder scaffold? Truly, friend, and methinks it must gladden your heart, after her troubles and sojourn in the wilderness, said the townsman, to find yourself at length in a land where iniquity is searched out and punished in sight of rulers and people, as here in our goodly New England. Yonder woman, sir, you must know, was the wife of a certain learned man, English by birth, but who had long ago dwelt in Amsterdam, when some good time agone, he was minded to cross over and cast in his lot with us of the Massachusetts, 
To this purpose he sent his wife before him, remaining himself to look after some necessary affairs. Mary, good sir, in some two years or less, then the woman has been a dweller here in Boston. No tidings have come from this learned gentleman, Master Prime. And this young wife, look you, being left to her own misguidance. Ha, ha, I conceive you, said the stranger with a bitter smile. So learned a man, as you speak of, should have learned this too in his books. And who, by your favor, sir, may be the father of yonder babe? It is some three or four months old, I should judge, which Mr. Shrine is holding in her arms. Of a truth, friend, that mare remains a riddle, and Daniel, who shall expound it, is yet a wanting, answered the townsman. Madam Esser absolutely refused to speak, and magistrates have laid their heads together in vain. Peradventure the guilty one stands looking on at this sad spectacle, unknown of men, and forgetting that God sees him. The learned man, observed the stranger with another smile, should come himself to look into the mystery. It behoves him well if he be still in life, responded the townsman. Now, good sir, our master such as magistracy, bethinking themselves that this woman is youthful and fair, and doubtless as strongly tempted to her fall, and that, moreover, as it most likely, her husband may be at the bottom of the sea, they have not been bold to put in force the extremity of our righteous law against her. The penalty thereof is death. But in their great mercy and tenderness of heart, they have doomed Mr. Sprine to stand only a space of three hours on the platform of the pillory, and then and thereafter, for the reminder of her natural life, to wear a mark of shame upon her bosom. A wise sentence, remarked the stranger gravely, bowing his head. Thus she will be a living sermon against sin, until the ignominious letter be engraved upon her tombstones. It irks me, nevertheless, that the partner of her iniquity should not at least stand on the careful by her side. But he will be known. He will be known. He will be known. He bowed courteously to the communicative townsman, and whispering a few words to his Indian attendant, they both made their way through the crowd. While they passed, Esther Prine had been standing on her pedestal, still with a fixed gaze toward the stranger, so fixed a gaze that, at moments of intense absorption, all other objects in the visible world seemed to vanish, leaving only him and her. Such an interview, perhaps, would have been more terrible than ever to meet him as she now did, with the hot midday sun burning down upon her face and lighting up its shame, with scarlet token of infamy on her breast, with sin-born infant in her arms, with the whole people drawn forth as to a festival, staring at features that should have been seen only in the quiet gleam of the fireside, in happy shadow of a home, or beneath a matronly veiled church. Dreadful as it was, she was conscious of a shelter in the presence of these thousand witnesses. It was better to stand thus, with so many between him and her, than to greet him face to face, they two alone. She fled for refuge, as it were, to the public exposure, and dreaded the moment when his protection should be withdrawn from her. Involved in this thought, she scarcely heard a voice behind her until it had repeated her name more than once, in a loud and solemn tone, audible to the whole multitude. Hearken unto me, Esther Prime, said the voice. It was already been noticed that directly over the platform on which Esther Prime stood was a kind of balcony, or open gallery, appended to the meeting house. It was the place where proclamations were on to be made, amidst an assembly of the magistracy, with all the ceremonial that attended such public observances in those days. Here, to witness the scene which we are describing, sat Governor Bellingham himself, with four sergeants about his chair, bearing Alberts as a guard of honor. He wore a dark feather in his head, a border of embroidery on his cloak, and a black velvet tunic beneath. Gentlemen advanced in years, with a hard experience written in his wrinkles. He was not ill-fitted to be the head and the representative of a community which owned its origins and progress, and its present state of development, not to the impulse of youth, but to the stern and tempered energy of manhood and some sagacity of age. 
accomplishing so much, precisely because it imagined and hoped so little. The other eminent characters, by whom the chief ruler was surrounded, were distinguished by a dignity of mien, belonging to a period when the forms of authority were felt to possess sacredness of divine institutions. They were, doubtless, good men, just and sage, but, out of all the human family, it would not have been easy to select the same number of wise and virtuous persons, who should be less capable of sitting in judgment on an earring woman's heart, and disentangling its mesh of good and evil, than sages of richest aspects towards whom Esther Prime now turned her face. She seemed conscious, indeed, that whatever sympathy she might expect lay in the large and warmer heart of the multitude, for, as she lifted her eyes towards the balcony, the unhappy woman grew pale and trembled. The voice which had called her attention was that of the Reverend and famous John Wilson, the eldest clergyman of Boston, a great scholar, like most of his contemporaries in the profession, and withal a man of kind and genial spirit. This last attribute, however, had been less carefully developed than his intellectual gifts, and was, in truth, rather a matter of shame than self-congratulation with him. There he stood, with a border of greased locks beneath his skull cap, while his grey eyes, accustomed to the shaded lights of his study, were winking, like those of Esther's infant, in the unadulterated sunshine. He looked like the darkling grave portrait which is he prefixed to all volumes of sermons, and had no more right than one of those portraits would have to step forth, as he now did, and meddle with the question of human guilt, passion and anguish. Esther Prime, said the clergyman, I have striven with my young brother here, under whose preaching of the word you have been privileged to sit. Here Mr. Wilson laid his hand on the shoulder of a pale young man beside him. I have sought, I say, to persuade his godly youth that he should deal with you, here in the face of heaven, and before these wise and upright rulers, and in hearing of all the people, as touching the vileness and the blackness of your sin. Knowing your natural temper better than I, he could the better judge what arguments to use, whether of tenderness or terror, such as might prevail over your hardness and obstinacy, and so much that you should no longer hide the name of him who tempted you to this grievous fall. But he opposes to me, with the young man's over-softness, albeit wise beyond his years, that it were wronging the very nature of human to force her to lay open her heart's secrets in such broad daylight, and in presence of so great a multitude. Truly, as I sought to convince him, the shame lay in the commission of the sin, and not in showing of it forth. What say you to it, once again, Brother Dimsdale? Must it be thou or I that shall deal with this poor sinner's soul? There was a murmur amongst the dignified and reverent occupants of the balcony, and Governor Bellingham gave expression to its purport, speaking in an authoritative voice, although tempered with respect towards the youthful clergyman whom he addressed. "'Good Master Dimsdale,' said he, "'the responsibility of this woman's soul lies greatly with you. It behoves you, therefore, to exert her to repentance and to confession as a proof and consequence thereof. The directness of this appeal drew the eyes of the old crowd upon the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale, a young clergyman who had come from one of the great English universities, bringing all the learning of the age into our wild forest land. His eloquence and religious fervor had already given the earnest of high eminence in his profession. He was a person of very striking aspect, with a white, lofty, and impending brow, large brown, melancholic eyes, and a mouth which, unless when he forcibly compressed it, was apt to be tremulous, expressing both nervous sensibility and the vast power of self-restraint. Notwithstanding his high native gifts and scholar-like attainments, there was an air about this young minister, an apprehensive, a startled, a half-frightened look, as of a being who felt himself quite astray, and at a loss in the pathway of human existence, and could only be at ease in some seclusion of his own. Therefore, so far as duties would permit, he trod in shadowy by path, 
and thus kept himself simple and childlike, coming forth, when occasion was, with a freshness and fragrance and dewy purity of thought, which, as many people said, affected them like the speech of an angel. Such was the young man whom the Reverend Mr. Wilson and the Governor had introduced so openly to the public notice, bidding him speak, in the hearing of all men, to that mystery of a woman's soul, so sacred even in its pollution. The trying nature of his position drove the blood from his cheek, and made his lips tremulous. "'Speak to the woman, my brother,' said Mr. Wilson. "'It is of moment to her soul, and therefore, as the worshipful governor says, "'moment to thin own, in whose charge hers is. "'Exhort her to confess the truth.' "'The Reverend Mr. Dimsdale bent his head in silent prayer, as it seemed, and then came forward. "'Esther Prine,' said he, leaning over the balcony and looking down steadfastly into her eyes. Thou hearest what this good man says, and seest the accountability under which I labor. If thou feelest it to be for thy soul's peace, and that thy earthly punishment will thereby be made more effectual to salvation, I charge thee to speak out the name of thy fellow sinner and fellow sufferer. Be not silent from any mistaken pity and tenderness for him. For, believe me, Esther, though he were to step down from a high place, and stand there beside thee, on thy pedestal of shame, yet better were it so than to hide the guilty heart through life. What can thou silence do for him, except it tempt him, yea, compel him, as it were, to add hypocrisy to sin? Heaven hath granted thee an open ignominy, that thereby thou mayest work out an open triumph over the evil within thee and the sorrow without. Take heed how thou deniest to him, who, perchance, hath not courage to grasp it for himself, the bitter but wholesome cup that is now presented to thy lips. The young pastor's voice was tremulous sweet, rich, deep, and broken. The feeling that did so evidently manifested, rather than the direct purport of the words, caused it to vibrate within all hearts, and brought the listeners into one accord of sympathy. Even the poor baby at Esther's bosom was affected by the same influence, for it directed his interested vacant gaze towards Mr. Dimsdale, and held up its little arms with a half-pleased, half-plaintive murmur. So powerful seemed the minister's appeal that people could not believe but that Esther Prine would speak out the guilty name, or else that the guilty one himself in whatever high or lowly place he stood, would be drawn forth by an inward and inevitable necessity, and compelled to ascend the scaffold. Hester shook her head. Woman, transgress not beyond the limits of heaven's mercy, cried the reverend Mr. Wilson, more harshly than before. That little baby hath been gifted with a voice, to second and confirm the counsel which thou hast heard. Speak out the name, that, and thy repentance, may avail to take the scarlet letter off thy breast. Never, replied Esther Prine, looking, not at Mr. Wilson, but into the deep and troubled eyes of the younger clergyman. It is too deeply branded. Ye cannot take it off. And would that I might endure his agony as well as mine. Speak, woman, said another voice coolly and sternly, proceeding from the crowd about the scaffold. Speak, and give your child a father. I will not speak, answered Esther, turning pale as death, but responding to this voice, which she too surely recognized. And my child must seek a heavenly father. She shall never know an earthly one. She will not speak, murmured Mr. Dimsdale, who, leaning over the balcony, with his hand upon his heart, had waited the result of his appeal. He now drew back with a long respiration. Round the strength and generosity of a woman's heart, she will not speak. Discerning the impracticable state of the poor culprit's mind, the elder clergyman, who had carefully prepared himself for the occasion, addressed to the multitude the discourse of sin, 
in all its branches, but with continual reference to the ignominious letter. So forcibly did he dwell upon this symbol, for the hour or more during which his periods were rolling over the people's heads, that it assumed new terrors in their imagination, and seemed to derive its scarlet hue from the flames of the infernal pit. As the prime, meanwhile, kept her place upon the pedestal of shame, with glazed eyes, and an air of weary indifference. She had borne that morning all that nature could endure, and, as her temperament was not of the order that escapes from too intense suffering by a swoon, her spirit could only shelter itself beneath a stony crust of insensibility, while the faculties of animal life remained entire. In this state, the voice of the preacher thundered remorselessly, but unavailingly, upon her ears. The infant, during the later portion of her ordeal, burst the air with its wailing and screams. She strove to hush it mechanically, but seemed scarcely to sympathize with its trouble. With the same hard demeanor, she was led back to prison, and vanished from the public gates within its iron clamped portal. It was whispered by those who peered after her, that scarlet letter threw a lurid gleam along the dark passageway of the interior. End of chapter 3 The Recognition Recording by Ana Sofia Simão, Portugal, 2007